So Lyra, we want to talk about something that is not related to Malaysia today. The last two episodes, we kind of focus uh, locally. But last Monday, there was something that kind of shocked the internet, right? Yep. So that was the Elon Musk talking with Donald Trump, 12th of August, 2024. Yeah, a conversation. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. We, you know, I, I kind of listened to the whole thing, uh, high quality audio. And Elon Musk started off by saying that, look, this is a conversation. It is not an interview. And I thought that was such a master move because he, he went on to justify it. He said, look, in a normal interview, it's very adversarial. You know, you will have a lot of exchange of notes. You have a lot of, this cannot be asked, that cannot be asked. If you ask this question, I'm walking out. <laughs> and it kind of remind me of the interview uh, our ex-Prime Minister Najib did, right? <laughs> Al Jazeera. But, yeah, Al Jazeera is one, but also... Uh, I, I think the one with Netflix, he, he okay, that, that time he didn't walk out, but he will say, uh, my lawyer advised me I couldn't say anything. And you see none of that in that two hours uh, interview. So so I think today we wanted not so much to break down because I, Lara, I think there are many, uh, there are many uh, other programs and sites that already break down. But I do want to begin with this statement, which is, immediately right after the interview, uh, sorry, we talk about interview, after the conversation, do you see all the mainstream media headline? Yeah. And, and I think one of our friends was doing a, a collage, you know, just, you know, all the mainstream, New York Times, BBC, The Guardian. And it's like, they have nothing positive to talk about it. And, and I mean, they are a bit more creative now, at least they don't copy each other's headline, like like some, some robotic uh, kind of thing. But, they, they were really, really negative and they really sounded like they were very hateful and I would even say fearful mm. of what is happening here because here you have two very, very influential people. So so what what maybe we can begin with that before we get into the discussion. Or why do you think you know there is this kind of reaction? Well, I think the first thing that really came into my mind was, you know, how quickly the media actually just sort of throw their weight around supporting Kamala Harris. Mm. So, so I felt like in a way, they, they can't bear to see that, hey, in, in just a few moments, I mean, initially you just have like 200 million views and then after a while, within a short span of a few hours, you, you literally get like a billion views, mm. which is crazy. I mean, you're talking about one in seven person around the globe that has listened to the whole conversation. So I think... They, so it, it's almost like a media sort of control where, hey, we need to do a bit of mitigation just to tapper down this whole thing. Mm. Let's, let's not make a bit fuss about this whole thing. So it, it's like if we are saying that Kamala Harris is trending, then let's all just put our weight around that, that particular topic and just say, hey, man, this is just, no, no one has listened to it. You think that the media is like talking about this whole thing, making such a huge hoo-ha about this whole thing, but it's just nah, nothing to be worried about. I felt like it's really that because mm. uh, what what we really see throughout this whole election cycle is that the media is really, really manifesting where it, more and more you're actually seeing that, hey, actually the president of the United States is now being controlled by the media. So mm. they have to follow a certain narrative. Yes, we have been talking about like them be becoming echo chamber, but like what you say, they have become somewhat a bit creative, not not sort of like a copycat, yet you can still see that they are echoing each other in in different terms. Yeah, that, that was what we discussed in the previous episode, right? You know, so, so social media especially kind of come into now, of course, the, the legacy media, they have all the rights to give opinions and they are subject to the, the media law. Uh, but, but one of the things about uh, the whole thing on, on ads kind of remind, reminded me of when ads hosted Tucker Carlson after he was kind of, you know, removed from Fox, right? And there was quite a huge event, but this one is bigger, yep. much bigger, right? And now the other thing about the data release from ads, talking about the biggest group that engage and is the age range 25 to 34 millennial, that, that's your, your generation, 70%. Yes. Now, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is really the technological, technology literacy. And maybe the older gang wouldn't know how to log in app and things like that. But it's still astounding, right? 70% of the 
close to 1 billion engagement. That, that's how... Now, of course, people will be like, oh, how do you know people listen to the whole thing? Too? I mean, social media doesn't work like that. When, when they give a data and say engagement, you, you know, it, it's like, oh, this, this channel is popular. They have a... You count everything. You can't say, oh, for Donald Trump and Elon Musk, we have to put special rule. You must sit there and watch. How many people sit there and watch uh, two hours, uh, listen two hours of the conversation? But you can say that for every top channel of all social media. Most people are just there for seconds, right? But anyway, g- g- give me your comments since that's kind of like your generation. No, I thought what was the most interesting thing that, that, that really just sort of what we can see in our local scene is during a time when there is uh, a lot of fear concerning Green Wave. Mm. And, and one of the things that was coming into my mind was really the use, widespread use of TikTok in political campaigns that PASS is aggressively using. So in this case, I felt like it was very, very genius move of what Elon Musk is doing to literally indirectly, hey, you're talking about a, an outreach of one billion person. How much money do you have to put in if this was going on an advertisement? So talk about that sort of impact, like you indirectly supporting, a, basically like endorsing a presidential candidate and just having that sort of honest and deep conversation and actually what they are doing is they are really reaching to the group of people who are low information voters, who are low propensity and you're talking about this group of person who just sort of like casually scroll through your social media and then, hey, like suddenly there's this thing that is trending and people are like just genuinely listening to the all the topics that are really deep to their hearts and mm. hey, how do, how do we make our lives prosperous again. So that, that's the kind of thing that I felt like it was the most authentic about this whole conversation. And I think that's the thing that my age group would like to hear mm. rather than something that is very scripted. And because I think what makes uh, Olympic so fun to watch was because of the, that, there's that sort of sportsmanship and authenticity that comes out of it. And when people are like just rallying behind certain gymnasts or certain Athlete, and I think I see the same sort of support that is coming behind mm. these two giants. Yeah, it's interesting you use the word authenticity because that is precisely what Donald Trump has over all his rival. I mean, you talk about unscripted, you talk about, you know, when he was sharing about, you know, the, the assassination attempt and he was, you know, he kept saying that, look, on that day, you know, usually the chart is on this side. Usually I do it towards the end. You know, he went in land. And it's really like he has that, you know, he's just like very creative and very spontaneous. And everyone would be like, for that split moment, you know, because he turned at the right angle, the, the bullet kind of just scrapped through. The, yeah, yeah, and the funniest part about that conversation is that because he was talking about illegal immigration, which is a topic that was deep in his heart. Yep. And and then Elon Musk just sort of joke and say, hey, illegal immigration saved your life. And he, <laughs> he kind of like actually second it. And mm. he, it. So I think it was that sort of like, it's almost like a friend talking to another friend, mm. sort of authentic, authenticity. Yeah. Yep. So today we're not so much uh, doing a breakdown because there are, we already mentioned there are many other sites. In fact, um, if you want to kind of break down the key points, um, I, I think one of the new site that we follow, uh, National Pulse. Uh, I think Charlie Kerr on ads is doing a good uh, live uh, kind of commentary and just kind of uh, summarize. Of course, we'll look at some of the points that really interest us, but we really want to look at the whole conversation from three perspectives, right? Before the conversation, during the conversation itself, and also what is the, the lasting impact in terms of what's happening around the world and maybe towards the election cycle. So of course the whole thing uh, when the interview was announced and and one of the first major news was basically a threat right from from this guy called uh, what was his name already uh, Thierry Brenton and he is a uh, European Commission one of the member of European Commission now European Commission is basically like the executive branch of European Union so they are the one you know it's like in a company you have the vice president you have uh, the, the senior manager, they do the work wrong. They are, they are not the board. They are not the, the high, they are not the highest level, but they are pretty high. So this guy he is, uh, he is in charge of enforcement of social media. And, and, and so he quickly came out and, and kind of issued an open letter. And you can go and read it on ads. It's so ridiculous because he is like, 
Yeah, or you, you know, before the interview conversation even began, he's like, oh, you need to be very careful. You, you better not allow misinformation and things like that. And, and, and then he say, well, you better ensure no violence, you know, is created and things like that. <laughs> I mean, it, Elon Musk basically, you know, reply with like F.O. kind of, you know, basically it's like, you know, that, that's not. But it kind of illustrated the, the arrogance of the, I mean, you want to call them the deep state, you want to call them the globalists, you know, we just kind of lump them together. So then, of course, the other guy who came out, um, I, I think roughly, uh, uh, so this guy used to be the, the senior Twitter management in charge of Europe, and his name is Bruce Daisley, okay? So he wrote in, I think, Guardian, and basically he said that, look, you know, if if Elon Musk is going to allow free speech, <laughs> you know, it's so ironic, right? That's why there's no free speech in Europe already. And I, I think that's the thing that a lot of people do not understand. There is so control and kind of, um, you, you know, just look back at the last episode we did talking about, you know, government wants to have more and more control, right? So this Bruce Daisley used to be senior management of Twitter. And he said, well, if Musk continue to be irresponsible, and, and that's another thing that you begin to see how the leftists behave is, they won't define your behavior. It, it, it's like, if you do something, what? They, they never define because it's a very elastic kind of thing. Then you say, well, we should tra- threaten him uh, with arrest and things like that, use the European law. So so these are the k- kind of, you know, it's like a manifestation of the, you know, in Malaysia, we have Minister of Truth. At, at least our Minister of Truth don't threaten to arrest people so randomly, right? <laughs> no. uh, I mean, not, not that bad, but it, it's a bit like the novel 19... 19- 84. Yep. And it's a British writer, by the way. And, and he was actually a socialist. But today, you can see United Kingdom kind of morphing towards that with the new administration. But we'll, we'll talk about that another time, okay? So so anyway, the, 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 that, that's the, the backdrop of everything. And then, of course, the interview conversation itself, it was delayed for a while because of DDoS. Uh, DDoS, yeah. And, and so did you see Kamala Harris campaign came out and praised the DDoS? Yeah, I think I think there was. And, and kind of, it is like, I, I don't know, you know, you know, when we were younger, when we look at American presidential or general election contests, we always see that as kind of like a fair go, right? Everyone will be like honorable, but that kind of pretense are all thrown out already. So I just find it so absurd. Now, of course, going back to Elon Musk, he had endorsed Donald Trump. But he say, as the owner of apps, I will also allow Kamala Harris to do the same thing. Mm. Unscripted conversation if she wants. But up to today, I think this morning, she just had the first press conference with her running mate. And they were talking about, I don't know, burritos and things like that. No policy. So everyone is asking, where, where is your policy? And even Democrat supporters are, are saying, where is the policy? No, the funniest thing is that I, I don't see why people will actually buy into what she is saying because, hey, you are a sitting vice president of the United States mm. and you have literally, the, you are the second most powerful person in the world. I mean, yeah. in the States as well. And yet you say, hey, when I'm, if, I'm elected as the president. I'm going to fix this. Can't, can't you fix certain things now? Mm. So so that's like super absurd that people would actually buy into that. And and she's like, the whole campaign is just trying to get to that same social influence, uh, influencer sort of, um, mm. sort of like control. Hey, let's just get like a lot of people just buying into this. Hopefully we'll get that kind of um, support that is being rendered to the former President Trump. So it felt like it's so crazy and so bizarre. And, and before Kamala, of course, uh, Biden's campaign, remember, he was leveraging on uh, Hollywood and he was like recruiting Taylor Swift and even his campaign manager, Jeffrey Katzenberg, or, or DreamWorks. So getting all these people, but Kamala is not even doing that, you know. It, it's like another level and not talking to people, you know, doing fake rally and things like that. AI uh, generated. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm just thinking, what are they thinking? It, it, are they so confident of the fix? You know, we kept talking about the fix. 
you know it's a fix, right? I mean, in, in Malaysia, we're so, uh, we, we, we know the fix as in elections result fix. Because, you know, our system, you know, first past the post, it is very, you just need to get that simple majority, you're over already. And, and that is why whenever people don't come out to vote and things like that, it, it makes a huge difference. The last UK election just kind of demonstrated that the Tories, a, 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 a sizable percentage didn't show up and and Labour almost obtained two-thirds. Yep. So it, it's a fixed thing. I mean, from Malaysian experience, we know there is a fix, but the fix is limited because if you have enough people coming out to vote, the fix can be overcome. So of course in US, the fix are much more ingenious because I think a lot of people don't quite understand that the election law in United States are state by state. Every state have different voting law. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but it is what it is. The founding fathers decided that they need to have a decentralized uh, system. So, you, you know, that's why during the COVID era, you know, can you mail in your vote? Can you just put into a, uh, you know, th there's a lot of challenge on that. You know, if I just put a blank vote, there's no signature, there's no ID and things like that. Can it be, even be counted? I mean, I can just get a very high quality laser printer. I can print a few million vote, right? If you don't need ID, you don't need registration, you don't have time frame, you don't have deadline. So it's like if you study the, the election situation in US, it's just mind blown. But anyway, we're not getting there. So I think this is maybe a good time for us to, to move into the, the conversation itself, okay? So what, what are some of the things that really caught your attention? I, I mean, we're not doing a recap because that will take forever, right? No, no. But just some of the things that kind of interest you. No, I think the part on the education hmm, yeah, yeah. is seriously mind-blowing. As in, he, President Trump mentioned that he, he wants to move education back to the States. I think that's almost unimaginable in Malaysia. So I felt like that, that was the part that is... If you really, if there's one thing that you can define about this, why why this presidential election is so crucial is mm. that it is really a fight between. Does federal sh should federal have more rights than the states, or should yeah. states have more rights than the federal? So so I felt like it's really going back almost like it's that sort of genius design mm. that is given by the founding fathers, where eventually all this thing will sort of. If you vote right, if you will, if you will see what you want to see, and you you really can see that hey, the states will still have their own respective um, rights that are being respected. So I felt like that was so seriously like so mind blowing. Yeah, and the other thing about the American Constitution, which uh, I think people need to understand, is when they look at the administration today, they, they, it seems like very federal heavy. But that was, you know, it was the last 100 years only, they started to become more federal heavy. Now, of course, every time, if all the states agree, that's why something like prohibition can happen. Because you have enough people who are crazy enough to say that we need to legislate morality when it comes to drinking. Of course, they quickly regret it because that actually has a counter effect. The, 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 oh, 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 the bootleg and, and things like that come out. And in fact, people drink a lot more during prohibition. But anyway, it just shows that if enough states come together and say we want to have a federal law, then it can be done. You, but you have to do it at a constitution level. But what's happening now is that you have a lot of federal law kind of like, like education. Education is basically still kind of half-half, you know. You have certain funding from federal. But in US, a lot of education are basically private and a lot are, you know, legacy of states and things like that. But if you talk about the funding and control goes back to state, and that's exactly what Sarawak is now fighting for, right? They want education, they want health. And PMS is not saying no, right? No. And that's why I'm just thinking, you know, I mean, we'll do another episode on PMS and some of the recent announcement in Malaysia is just a bit mind blown. But he's not, I mean, one of the things I could see the politicians in West Malaysia doing will be, you know, let Sarawak have their cake and, you know, it doesn't affect us. But I think it's not a bad thing if you give education and health autonomy to Sarawak because if they do well, all the other states here, you can imagine Penang, Selangor, Johor will be the first. We'll be like, hey, we also want the same because their education will be comparable, if not better than Sabah and Sarawak. 
mm. in, in terms of the development and maturity. And we still have not fully lost the British legacy. Not fully yet. So I, I think it's a good thing, right? And and it, since you talk about Trump and, and he, he his full quote, right, after he said they moved education back to the States and he said, oh, the 50 states, I will bet that 35 will do great. And 15 of them, as you know, 15, 20 of them will be as good as Norway. See, Norway is a benchmark for education. So here he, he make a very interesting point and maybe it, it's more indirect. It is when you give power to state level, many states will do well, but a few will screw up. Hmm. So it's like the choices of the voters, the choices of the politician could cause a state to become very badly run or very well run. But that's the beauty of democracy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I heard some people say, oh, if you do that, some states will be left behind. Well, I mean, when we talk about policing and things like that, it's a very tough situation, but surely the, the residents and voters, they have to be somewhat responsible for what's happening. And that's why the, the saying, right, elections have consequences. Hmm. So what are the things that, that really uh, interest you from the conversation itself? I mean, so many interesting, I mean, even climate change and things like that. <laughs> I like the part where he was being very honest with someone who is an electric car vehicle maker. Mm. And he said, hey, Tesla is great. You make great products, but drill, baby, drill. <laughs> he <laughs> just literally said that. And I felt like that was... That was such an honest sort of conversation where you, you can genuinely praise Elon Musk for the, the great vehicles. I mean, yes, Tesla make great cars. I mean, they are nice. I mean, if we have all the wealth that we can afford, why not? I mean, you get, get an electric car for all you want. But the thing is, he also understands that, hey, it's the energy that really will bring in the revenue for mm. the country. And, and he just basically, the authenticity that Trump showed was that he doesn't pander to anyone at all. I mean, yeah. can you imagine if Kamala Harris is here today and talking to Elon Musk? She'll definitely just quickly fold to like, hey, well, let's go into more green energy, uh, climate change, climate control a little bit more and things like that. I mm. mean, she'll be a snake to this person and she'll be talking a different thing altogether. But you see Trump is being consistent throughout. Yeah. And I think Elon took the opportunity to kind of uh, explain his view on climate change, which I find very interesting. And this is something that we have talked about sometimes here, which is, look, we're not against uh, renewable, we're not against sustainability, but what you're trying to do now with EV mandate, is here we come the word mandate again. And it's very similar to the whole vaccine issue. When you want to mandate something that is not proven, you can kill people, you can harm people. And that's what uh, Elon Musk was saying in the, in the conversation that if you take away uh, fossil fuel immediately, you, you know, farmers will starve and, and things won't work. And he also admitted that the renewable technology is not quite there. And there's no urgency now. Of course, after that, you see New York Times and all those try to do fact check. But I think one of the things that um, our viewers and listeners is you have to be aware. And I just kept thinking about this. If you always consume mainstream media, you're going to find some of the conversation very hard to process. But what if we say to you today that climate change is hardly a settled science? And a lot of people cannot imagine that because to them it's settled. It's not. And so, it, I mean, you can have different views. Elon Musk says it's not settled. You can disagree with him. But... It just shows that when the richest man on earth make a statement, at least there is some validity for people to argue for or, or against it. So, so I think this is the thing that people need to begin to, to process so that you are not always under the thumb of mainstream media. So, so I think for this episode, since if some, some people are interested in the breakdown, we'll put Charlie Kirk and National Power's link. Those yep. will be like your gateway to some alternative view and kind of remind me of what Jeffrey Kattensburg, uh, Biden previous uh, campaign chair, co-chairperson was saying, and, and he was telling his donors, I think we mentioned this last episode, and he said, trust me. <laughs> if Not you don't there. trust me, still trust me, but verify. Actually, I thought that is pretty good, you know, because it, it's like, that, that means on the foundation, I want you to believe me, but I want you to fact check me. 
And I think that's the thing a lot of people don't do in mainstream media is, you, you know, you look at, uh, so, so, so with regards to this conversation, some of our friends, I, I think David Yang was showing us BBC, right? And he said, look, the, the comments in BBC exploding. So we went to have a look and I, I was quite delighted to see that all the comments are against mainstream media. It's like, what the heck are you doing? You think you are so smart and things like that. So it seems like, and, and I think this is a millennial, you know, your generation, which previously will be the one that is, I, I mean, it's not I mean, watch. okay I, i'm not saying brainwash i'm saying that they are they're probably biden's uh, democrats european union bigger supporter but you can also see that there is a shift because maybe life is becoming harder inflation is killing them i, I don't know do, do you feel that with your generation that life is getting harder it, it, it's not like your generation compared to my generations even in terms of acquisition of property and things like that it is it, it's, it's going to be like my generation is still relatively easy. Your generation is getting harder unless you have a certain income level or you have some inheritance, would you agree? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you just talk about like the sort of income as a fresh graduate that you get 10 years ago and maybe 20 years ago and you just compare it with today. It's still, I don't see much improvement. Mm. And yet we have like the the billion allocation that is going into our civil service. <laughs> so we just... Yeah, yeah, since you talk about 10 billion, let, let me just talk a little bit about what Elon Musk said because, and, and he make it very clear. And I think a lot of people don't understand inflation because people usually think inflation in terms of price that gone up, mm. supply and demand, but it's not that. The main cause of inflation, especially in nations, is when you, you spend more than you have. So and he, he, he says something very interesting. He said, well, if government issue a check, it will never bounce, right? True. So PMX wanted to give 10 billion to upgrade the salary of civil serv servant. That check will not bounce. But how do you do it? You print money. So when you print money, inflation comes in. So actually, I didn't quite understand it in, in such a way, you know, until, you know, remember we had this conversation with Kev about Bitcoin, Bitcoin. and things like that. So, you know, when, when I started to research Bitcoin, then, then I understand and it makes sense, you know, when you look at the money supply, Malaysia, you know, all these data are readily available. But anyway, that, that, that's the thing, you know, I, I think we're going to have to do one episode very soon on, on PMS recent major announcement, right? Which yeah, we should. Now, we now should. you look at the comments are blowing out. But I think let's, let's talk about one more thing and then we want to kind of go into a conclusion already. And, and I think it's actually, now, now of course, the... The, the, the impression because later on I think he, he posted uh, a, a much clearer version and uh, of course because it's a conversation with Donald Trump tr Trump side gets the clearer audio so he get the like caller audio you know but he did make some interesting point every now and then I, I, I think this one which he's trying to explain why he support Donald Trump I think this is the one that causes the mainstream media to really go crazy. And he said this, and I quote, historically, I was a moderate Democrat. And in fact, he went into the whole story of, on how he waited six hours to shake hands with Obama because he was like so impressed with Obama. And, but, he said, but now I feel like we're at a critical juncture for the country. For the people out there in the moderate camp, I think you should support Donald Trump for president, the common sense president. So, that is very damaging, especially if, you see, election is won in the margin. You know, you and me, any election, we know who we're going to vote and, and things like that, but there will be a lot of people undecided uh, or, or for whatever reason. They are just not interested. They are not interested to read 10 news per day. They are, you know, it's not like they are smarter or less smart. They are just not interested. And, and so people like that are starting to feel like, hey, I need to do something because my life is being affected. It's like I go somewhere, I buy a donut, it's costing me six US dollar now or whatever, you know, or a local equivalent. And people started to, I think when you, you are hit by the pain, maybe your brain will start to think. Yeah, I mean, that that is the saying that goes to the parenting, right? Yep, yep, so... So, so it's very fascinating interview. Um, and the only other thing I will kind of mention is just the, the energy 
uh, the stamina. I, I I know it's a bit ask for you uh, you to go through two hours of long format and things like that. It, you know, it, it's not easy. Not not everyone likes this kind of. But I, I just look at President Trump, the energy, the stamina, the ability to switch topic. It is astounding. And I think that also put a lot of fear in the, in his opponent because it's like, wow, this is a guy that really knows what he's doing. Because, uh, okay, this is the final point already. It, and before we move to the conclusion. And, and he said, look, wh- why should I be doing this? I don't need to be doing this. I could be retiring. I have all the money. But he couldn't bear to see the country being destroyed. So, Lara, you have anything else that kind of caught your attention before we move into the, the, the third point? And final part to conclude, you know. Well, I think the he also talked about the the border policy. Mm. So I felt like that's that's also one part where, I mean, I, I I can't help but just think about the the point when Trump just make his announcement to run for the president, mm. and the two things that are close to his heart is drill, baby, drill, mm. and the next one is border control, border security, and. Here you have the op- opponent that is the border czar. That Supposedly. Is doing, yeah, that's not doing anything <laughs> Who has at not all. visited the border for three years. Yeah, and and so like with Elon Musk just saying about all this thing, I mean, it, it's just interesting because you're talking about a country that is actually very welcoming to migrants. Mm. I mean, it is a country that is full of migrants, yet you have the restoration of American dream that is in place. So, so I felt like that's really that that thing that is very um, intriguing about this mm. whole conversation because it's it's really really a lot of it is about the American dream that was lost and now, hey, let's bring this back again. You see, one of the things about illegal migrant is that you are destroying the dreams of legal migrant. Mm. So someone like Elon Musk is a legal migrant. Yep. And I, 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 also very interesting that Trump kind of compared with all the all the challenges with China, with Russia, even with Ukraine, he said, look, none of these challenges compare to the border because it's a do or die. And it's very interesting because the media should be holding the current administrations accountable, but they are not. And, and, and so that's why the, the, the media is complicit in the whole thing and people are fed up, especially those southern states, they are living with the drama of the... I mean, they, they, in fact, it's worth listening to their whole conversation on, on the migrants because they make some maybe politically incorrect points, you know, And but it's the truth, you know. Sometimes the truth is not politically correct. All right, so with this, uh, let, let's move on to the, to the last part already and we want to kind of talk about what happened after the interview. So this is like day five, day six already. And, and, and we kind of talk about... Um, uh, the, this European Commission guy, right, Thierry Brenton, right, and, and he's a French guy from IT background, and so very interesting. The IT guy came out and said, "You better censor." You know, sounds like a Google overlord, right? And but here's a, a, a news that came out uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, this one is, uh, yeah, this one is from Europe Politico. 13th of August, 2024, just a few days ago, right? And the headline, and I quote, EU takes shot at Musk over Trump interview and misses. So they kind of acknowledge that it didn't work. Right? But anyway, let, let, let me just quickly sum out the, the, the article, then maybe you can give me your thought because we started off with he threatened it and then after the whole interview, there's a lot of backlash because, so this, this guy, a, a member of European Commission, Thierry Brenton, he was accused of meddling in American elections. And in fact, even his own staff came out and, you know, of course, anonymous and things like that and say that the whole the whole letter you can see in ads, you know, is, is, is it the thing about publishing something online is there forever. You can't undo it. And, you know, for, for better or for the worse. So so anyway, according to, to four European Union officials speaking on anonymity, <laughs> and, and they say that, look, this Brenton didn't even inform the commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, about his public post. And he said that many within EU were surprised. Because here's the thing, they say, even though EU is like not very happy with Trump and things like that, they don't want to be seen as potentially interfering with the election. And a few days ago, Senator Mike Lee of Utah, he posted a lot on, on ads, I think, like 
you know, it's like 20 screenshot. And basically, he's just saying that, look, here we are, United States of America, we are providing security for the whole Europe through NATO. And, and you're insulting our elections process. At the very least, he said we should threaten to withdraw the support. And which, you know, Trump has been saying, right, if you don't pay, I'm, I'm taking, and people are like, how can you, how can you? It's just... Why should you be receiving free stuff, right? Then, of course, the 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 CEO of X, uh, Linda Yacarino, immediately after the letter, she, she responded, an unprecedented attempt to stretch a law intended to apply in Europe to political activities in the US. And then she also added, it's an insult to the people in Europe because now you think, you, you, are, you, you are assuming that the people in Europe cannot think. So, so what do you think of all these things? You know, do you think you know the the oppositions, uh, you know the you know the the Guardian, all, all those things, and even even UK Prime Minister was making some threat, right, to Elon Musk? Yeah, I mean he is. It, it's just well, I, I just really, really, really just feel like this whole conversation is super duper worth listening to. Because I mean, so you think people should should listen to it? Definitely, definitely. In, I mean, in full or, or or go for summary. I mean, do you think it's suitable for everyone? Well, it is actually. It's very very pleasant. You you'll be more surprised than you think. I mean, okay. Then we should put a link there <laughs> because I think Elon Musk has put the high quality version. No, actually, it's very. It's quite easy to to, to hear. Yeah, I, definitely. I agree with you. Because it's definitely not scripted. Mm. It's definitely not like a it's quite interview entertaining. sort of <laughs> format, and it's just like really listening to. I mean, that's what I think my generation will like it. Mm. As in, literally, because we, we look at the social media influencer, the thing that we talk about is like when they do their makeup and then they were just talking about their live things. Mm. So it's very similar in that sense. So I felt like two hours would just fly by when, when you just sort of tap into it. And it's very, very entertaining and very, um, I would say it, it actually enlightens you in many, many ways. And the things where you have not had certain stand before, mm. you should really listen to it and then begin to think for yourself. So I felt like this will actually bring back common sense to a lot of people. So on the note of all this backlash that is happening, so I felt like it's interesting because this is an election year and never before you have seen so much manifestation. Mm. I mean, we have seen meltdowns in 2016, 2020, 2020. Yep. This is another level. This is, yeah, a whole lot of the next level. And, and I felt like it's really actually the whole nation is progressing towards the right direction because you have a lot of clamping down of uh, a lot of misinformation, those sort of things that are just like being thrown in your face day in, day out. And mm. to see that, hey, there's a disparity between what the media are saying and then there are certain European leaders that you look up to and even the Prime Minister of UK that you... Some, some people will just buy into all this thing mm. and yet you begin to see, hey, how come... They, they are talking about different things and that is very contradictory to what I believe in. So that, that part, I felt like there is a huge awakening mm. that is happening and the media has not seen that sort of yeah. huge awakening yet. So so in, in analysing the, the conversation, I think we're going to end with this already. And this is Fox News host, Great Gut Felt. And he, he said this and, and I'm going to read the whole thing because I think it, it is worth uh, listening. He said, the interview is good. You know, yeah, like, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then you say the but the but the bigger story is that two of the most important world figures agree on the world. What does that tell you? The most consequential technical genius perhaps ever, and the most consequential political figures are talking about stuff on equal footing. And Trump knows everything Musk is talking about concerning energy, AI, economic development, and no politician could energetically engage on future problems like this. Most will need a staff of ten doing packets of research for each topic and still the politician will have no idea what to think. And I, I think that kind of sum out the character, you know. It, it's like you think about Trump, his background, he is the OG reality show guy. And reality show guy is basically what you see is what you get. You know, it, it, I don't know how many of you, you know, in the 80s, 90s, when we, we start to use personal computer, there's this concept called what you see is what you get. Because... It used to be, you know, you have monochrome screen, black and white, green color. I don't know if you ever use those. I, when I first started PC, I have those. So you see your letter and what print out is very different. 
Then finally, you get modern Macintosh, Windows, and they start to have this concept. What you see is what you get. So, you know, these days you see Microsoft Word formatting, you print out Excel. You, 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 there's no surprise, right? Print preview, print screen. And I think this is the thing, like, like you were saying, that people want authenticity, but of course, there is also substance. You know, if you're authentic and you talk rubbish, I mean, I see you, you, you have... <laughs> You have yeah. zero content. That's not going to work, right? No. But I, I'm quite impressed with this. I, I mean, remember when he had that interview with Paul Logan? <laughs> it was, uh, I think it kind of opened out a lot of the younger generation guy. He's like, wow, Trump knows about wrestling. He knows about ET. You know, he Idiot. knows about Area 51. <laughs> it's like, it's, it, I guess, you, you know, people want a leader that is interested in their life and, you know, knows a bit of pop culture and things like that. So, but anyway, I, I think that that's kind of pretty much the time we have for unpacking. Uh, but of course, ne next, uh, we, we kind of say that the next few episodes we're going to come back to talk about, you know, M Malaysia, Malaysia Day, and, you know, maybe some of the things that we have been saying here, the, the federal and states kind of struggle and tussle we want to continue. So, so any other concluding point? From no, your side? you should definitely listen to the conversation. <laughs> All right, so we will put the link there and also just the, sound, the, the one that we mentioned, National Powers and, and Charlie, Charlie Kirk. Kirk. And just, just as a reference, because you know, if you don't trust our recommendation, then at least trust and verify. Or <laughs> you can watch the TikTok videos mm. by Trump. Yeah, yeah, he just kind of signed out and 10 million people already signed out. Ooh, impressive. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today and until next time. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.